Confirmed live, man, Carol. Brilliant. Thanks, Emer. So we'll have a quorum um, and just to confirm um, with the committee that the meeting's been held virtually. Emer, I'm assuming you've received no apologies and no one has let you know if they're coming in by phone rather than by Starleaf. Is, is that the case? That is the case that Tom confirmed. Yes, yes Tom confirmed. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so get, we'll make sure and take a note that Gary's apologies are recorded. Um, so I don't know what your screen's like, but I find I can't see the hand raising facility on mine. So between myself and Emer, we're just if you indicate, we'll try and keep a, a bit of order and get people in. Um, so it's just just to advise that. Um. Again, Gary has replaced Paul on the committee, and we just want to put our thanks uh, on the record and welcome Gary back. Um, so, Emer, um, there has there's no uh, has there been any notice of any member who's delegated authority to another member on the committee if a, a vote is needed. None received. Huh? Yes. Well, hopefully, we'll not need that anyway. So. And I just want to advise you all that the committee will receive an update on the current position regarding our strategic planning and also to propose that we move into a closed session at the end of the meeting to further consider our strategic planning. Is that agreed? Okay, okay. So before I begin item uh, one, um, you'll be aware that we asked or we were due to meet on the 3rd of March to consider responses to letters I issued to the executive and the speaker in relation to the NDNA commitments and private members' bills. Um, so given that responses were not expected to be received in time for the 3rd of March meeting, and in accordance with Stanton Order 116, the, the committee agreed not to meet on that date, but to agree any actions by way of correspondence. So included in these actions was a request to seek the committee's agreement to receive a briefing on the review of statement of entitlements for an official opposition. And following agreement, this briefing has been scheduled for today's agenda. Uh, the committee also agreed for further information to be brought back on the topics of private members' bills, EU exit implications, <coughs> which are on the committee's strategic planning priority list. So. Um, We've covered our apologies. We just need now to um, agree our draft minutes of the 17th of February 2021. And I think they're on page five. So our members can tend to agree those minutes. Agreed. Okay. okay, great stuff. Thank you. And just again, that our committee motion to amend Stanton Order 112, <coughs> I can see it. In respect to the 9.30 deadline, denominator proxy vote was agreed by the Assembly on Monday with the March, which was great. And members will also recall that the committee agreed to write to the Speaker to inform him of the committee's deliberations prior to the motion coming to the House. The Speaker has responded to the committee and provided a copy of the updated guidance, which we all should have now received. And a copy of the Speaker's letter is at page 12 of our PACs. So are members content to note the speaker's letter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On. Thank you very much. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Broadcasting to bring Trevor Rainey into the spotlight for the setting of business. If that's okay, Emer. That's Trevor. Um, he's in the audience currently. I'll just confirm. I think that's him confirmed now. Thanks, Emer. Um, we can't, I can't see him yet, but Trevor, if you're there, you might want to just say hello. Oh, Trevor, I can see you now. I can see you now. Good. Well, oh. good, good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, Trevor. Um, and so what we decided to do was to, by way of correspondence, was to receive a briefing on a review of the statement of entitlements for an official opposition. Um, so 
members, page 22 of your pack um, is a paper from the clerk which provides the background context to the briefing provided by Trevor today. Um, congratulations, Trevor, and you've been appointed uh, to head up this process through a very successful tender and by the Assembly and Res Executive Review Committee to undertake a review. So, Trevor, I want to formally welcome you to the meeting. Um, and if you can, just begin to brief the committee. So, thank you, Trevor. Good. Well, thank you very much, Chair, and it's a pleasure to be with you, albeit in the strangest of circumstances. Yeah. It's nice to see some familiar faces on screen and Perhaps before the end of my review, I might be able to talk to you face to face, but uh, we'll see how things progress in the, in the coming weeks and months. But thank you, Chair. I, I just want to take advantage of this afternoon of the opportunity to touch on three issues with the committee. Firstly, is to give an overview of the review. Uh, we have a very helpful paper from the clerk in terms of the background and the terms of reference. But to touch a little on the terms of reference, the methodology and the timetable for the review. Secondly, just to, to highlight the potential for some recommendations that may come out of the review, uh, working their way through to the Committee on Procedures, and just to, to highlight that at this stage. And then, Chair, for the uh, Committee uh, and its members to highlight to me any issues that you feel I should consider as I go forward uh, with the review. So I'll touch on these three points, uh, Chair, and then uh, leave it open for questions and, and comment at the end. So you have received a copy of the terms of reference in your pack, uh, along with the background to the issue of the official opposition and the entitlements of an official opposition in the Assembly. And this goes back some five years or more and covers the Fresh Start Agreement, Stormont House Agreement, the Opposition Act in 2016, and most recently, the new decade, new agreement uh, deal, out of which falls uh, this review. The timetable for the review I was commissioned about a month ago, and uh, my uh, target date is to provide a report to AARC in early June. Uh, so it will be a, a piece of work that's been running for a month and will continue for another three months or so. The methodology I'm adopting for the review is uh, twofold. Firstly, to undertake some research around the issue of opposition and opposition entitlements. Looking back on the research and reports that have previously been done in the Assembly, looking at uh, other parliaments that might provide uh, helpful comparators, and uh, looking at what academics and think tanks uh, may uh, be able to contribute to the review. And the second part of the work is consultation uh, with parties and the independent members, and then with yourselves as the Committee of Procedure and also with the Speaker and the uh, Assembly Commission. I have issued a, a letter and a consultation template to all the parties and independents, and I have set the deadline of the end of March for that uh, to be returned. I have one response received so far, which is encouraging, but if I could ask the committee members for their indulgence to encourage their own parties to respond by the deadline at the end of the month, that would be uh, very helpful. In looking at the review, obviously taking account of comparators, international best practice, taking account of the feedback from parties and independent members, and Speaker and Assembly Commission and yourselves, there are certain issues which I'll have to address as I go through the review. Firstly, as the focus of this review is considering the adequacy and effectiveness of the entitlements for official opposition, a significant task for me is to consider how best to assess adequacy and effectiveness. That's a challenge in what is not a very well-researched area. Finding appropriate and helpful comparators will be a challenge, given the very unique nature of the Northern Ireland uh, consociational form of government. Uh, looking at the level of resources in other places and trying to draw uh, appropriate comparators into the Northern Ireland context will be a challenge. And also looking at the procedural uh, entitlements around speaking rights and question rights and so on. And those are very greatly from parliament to parliament. And again, the challenge for me is to try and weigh those up and measure them against what is currently in place. 
And the final issue that I have to look at uh, as I go through is how best any recommendations I might make can be implemented, uh, whether there's a need for a change in legislation, which is obviously something that will be time consuming and, and, and difficult, but may be necessary in respect of some issues. Standing orders, which obviously are the main interest of the Committee on Procedures, and I would predict without having concluded the work, I would predict that there may be some recommendations that will uh, feed through in standing order changes or proposals for changing standing orders. And then there's also the work of the Business Committee and the Speaker in which some policies and practices rest and there may be recommendations that need to be addressed in that regard uh, as well. So at the conclusion of the review, uh, there may be some recommendations subject to ARC's consideration, subject to the assembly consideration of the ARC report and due course that may come through to the committee and require some work on standing orders. And I'm also conscious in relation to that, that there are outstanding issues with regard to standing orders from the 2016 Act, which I think are still on the committee's uh, work program. And there may be some overlapping or superseding between my recommendations and those that are already in existence. And that issue will have to be worked through in due course by uh, the committee. So, Chair, that was really to give you a very quick run through. You have a very helpful paper, which has given you uh, some detail around it. And I'm very happy to take questions on the review, take questions uh, on how I'm approaching it. But particularly, Chair, I'm keen to get any uh, feedback from yourselves as a committee on issues that I should be considering, issues that you may have of concern, uh, issues that you may foresee coming down the track. Uh, from my report that might create difficulties for the committee uh, that you might want to highlight at this stage and make me aware of. So I'm very happy now to take comments, questions, and to, to have some discussion, Chair, uh, that would be helpful to me and ultimately to the committee. So thank you very much for those few minutes to run through that. I'm very happy to take questions now and, and comments, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, um, Trevor. Um, and I appreciate that, um, you know, while this is resting with IRC, as you said yourself, there will be implications um, for revision of standing orders and changes of standing orders, and we need to get through that. I think when we previously discussed uh, official opposition, um, there was a concern that, um, you know, there may have been a, a non-due advantage to some of the smaller parties given the DeHunt system. So uh, I dare say that's something, you know, for example, a smaller party shouldn't have the same speaker nights as a larger party because that's undemocratic. But I suspect there are some of the issues that we'll be tackling as we, may, we make progress. And certainly if I could again repeat the appeal that Trevor has made for each of us to go back and talk to our parties about a response by the end of this month. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Kyle, Jerry, has his hand raised? Okay. Jerry, I can't see you, but go for it. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Trevor, for your presentation. Um, I suppose something that, that I'm uh, interested uh, in um, is the unofficial opposition. Uh, and I know it's it goes against the title of your paper because it's the official opposition, uh, but I wondered if, if there's been any consideration of it. Um, because I think at the minute... Uh, it's approximately 90% of, of MLAs um, or their party are, um, are in the in the executive. So you have a situation where, in effect, you have an unofficial uh, opposition for all intents and purposes. Um, so I just wanted to know if there's been any consideration uh, of that um, in terms of, you know, speaking time, resources, you know, because just to just to, to put it um, bluntly, um, I mean, there's occasions, Trevor, I'm sure you're aware, but in case you're not, where there's uh, sometimes debates when um, uh, parties not in the executive um, aren't able to contribute uh, or have uh, a chance to speak. And I know there's speaker's discretion and all these things, but I think if there's any way to, to increase um, uh, sort of provision for those parties who are not in the executive, um, that would be certainly interesting from our perspective, obviously, as a party, but also uh, many others. So, uh, yeah, just a quick question on that and, and uh, maybe follow up with another if you, if, uh, 
if I'm not satisfied or if I want to, want to further push it, that's okay. Thanks. Go for it, Jerry. Okay, Trevor, over to yourself. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. And I think, Jerry and Chair, uh, both your comments tie into an issue that uh, is the concept of what an official opposition is there for, what an official opposition can be comprised of. Current standing orders have a certain definition of, of who can go into opposition. The 2016 Act has another definition, uh, this figure of 8% of, of the seats in the Assembly. And uh, it would be open to me to consider whether either or both of those definitions are reasonable and sensible. But what I can cannot undo, Jerry, and, and I think this is something I have to be realistic about, uh, democracy is democracy and, and parties end up with a certain number of seats and the work of a parliament, no matter what system it is, it, it, there is a degree of proportionality on speaking rights and resources and so on. However, I am very conscious of the uh, difficulties that the small parties have in the consociational form of government, which mm -hmm. is what the Assembly is. And I will be giving that due consideration. And one of the uh, difficulties I have as I do my research is finding suitable comparators where I can go and look and see how it's operated there, how smaller parties are resourced and, and uh, given entitlements. So I think it is, to answer your question, yes, it's part of the review, but I have to be realistic in terms of the extent to which small parties can uh, enjoy rights and entitlements on the same scale as much larger parties. But the, the concept of opposition is, is around uh, challenging and holding to account the government of the day. And as you point out, Jerry, the, the government in a sense is, comprises 90% or thereabouts of members. So how does a, an opposition, however it's defined, provide that challenge and scrutiny and, and accountability? And that is certainly something that's in the mix of my thinking. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Trevor. And thank you, Jerry. I have no doubt you'll be coming back to us. Um, um, as is your your right and your prerogative. Are there any other members who want to make any comments at this stage? I'm not seeing any. Emer, are you seeing any? No hands raised, no. Char Trevor, that was a cheap round. <laughs> well, Chair, it's perhaps easy at the beginning of a review to uh, have an easy meeting. It might be more difficult at the other end, and I'm very yeah. happy. At, at any stage in time to come back and talk to the committee if you think that would be helpful or, no, at, the, it, yeah. or at the end of the review, uh, just um, available uh, and we can make some arrangement to suit the committee. Okay, no, Trevor, appreciate that. And I I, I think you might rue throwing yourself out there because by the, the end of all this, you'll be in and out of these committees like Fiddler's Elbows, but just to put it on your record, thank you. And um, and it's always a pleasure to meet with you and members. Yeah, no, right answer, Trevor. <laughs> okay, Trevor, take care. Stay safe. Thank you very much. I uh, you know. Thank you. Cheerio, Thank everyone. You, Trevor. Bye. Thank you, Trevor. Okay, members, you will recall also that we reaffirmed our commitment to continue our inquiry into the LCM procedures. So at page 35 of our PACs, is a memo from the clerk which provides an update to us on actions agreed at the meeting of the committee on the 3rd of February. Again, at page 49 is my letter to the executive seeking its views on the LCM procedures for your information. And also at page 52 is an email from the clerk of the House of Commons Procedures Committee. I wish to provide you with an update following engagement with other devolved le legislators. So, um, Emer, is everybody ready to go through this? We're just yeah. ready to go through? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it, can we put down at the end just actions of things to do? Because one of the actions I think we might want to do is just remind people, members that there's a, a point that Trevor made about parties coming back by the end of March. So if we're happy enough, we'll just go through the rest of the, the agenda. So in respect to Scotland and Wales, both legislators are currently winding down in preparation for their forthcoming elections. I think it's only a matter of weeks before their elections. So understandably, they're not in a position to engage at this point, but hopefully, Eamor, they will be soon after. So the House of Lords 
uh, Committee on Procedures has referred the committee to its fourth report and its recommendations, which are set out in Amor's paper. The House of Commons Procedures Committee is currently undertaking an inquiry which makes particular reference to LCMs and on which it strongly welcome a submission from our committee. So in addition, to, uh, officials from the Westminster have asked whether a private meeting between chairs or deputies or a joint meeting um, between the two procedures committees could be arranged in the coming months. So I just want to seek your views on that. Um, and if you're content for a written submission to be prepared in response to the Westminster inquiry and brought back the committee for consideration. Is that okay, folks? Yeah? Okay, I'm not seeing any dissent voices, Emer. Has anybody else indicated that they want to speak or anything in this? No, no hands raised. Okay. So, so how is that? Can I also ask whether an informal meeting might also be helpful between the chairs and deputy chairs, and this will be planned virtually with the committee. Is that agreeable, Tom? Would you be up for that? Happy enough, yeah. Okay, so is that if everybody content? Okay, good stuff. And then thirdly, the Institute of Government has undertaken relevant and useful work in relation to the LCMs and further details this work can be found in Amor's memo. So can I ask if the committee is content to invite the Institute to attend to a further meeting in order to address any specific issues that we may have in relation to the inquiry as part of the inquiry? Is that fair enough? Okay. And then finally, if no response have, has been received from the executive up until now to the request for input to the committee's inquiry. The members have a view of how long it wishes to wait for a response before concluding the ongoing inquiry. Emer, there's four of the options. We can just press on. We can't wait next day to respond later, Nick. Really, can we? Well, it's a matter for the committee to decide whether it wants to wait for that response. Um, it's not a requirement. Okay. So, so members, what I would do is uh, I'm proposing that we write a reminder to the executive telling them, informing them that our inquiry is imminent and just inviting them to respond. Um, we would welcome their response, but we should just proceed with our, our work. Our, our members are happy to agree. Content? Okay. Remember, can you do that? We'll put it down for the list of things to do at the end. We can go back over it again. So in terms of item number six, proxy voting, you'll remember that the purpose of this, this is to bring back for discussion to the committee to make sure that we're um, a process regarding the extent of the proposed amendment to Stanton Order 27 brackets 11 in relation to proxy voting. So a page 55 year pack is a paper from Emer, And at the end of our meeting on the 3rd of February, there was a consensus amongst us that any proposal to introduce po proxy voting on a permanent basis should include parental leave and long-term illness. Subsequently, the committee also agreed to seek legal advice on drafting revised standing orders based on this proposal. But at our meeting on the 17th of February and during discussions on the committee's proposal to amend <coughs> these temporary provisions in respect to the half nine deadline, a number of members discussed examples of unforeseen circumstances, which could potentially affect a member and their ability to nominate a proxy on any given day. So given that the provisions for unseen circumstances was not agreed by the committee as part of its original proposal, a further discussion, in my opinion, is required to reconsider and confirm the extent of any policy change. So can I seek your views um, on if you still wish to consider extending the scope of the previously agreed policy to include unforeseen circumstances? Content? Okay. So, um, Emer, I suppose if we're, we're consent, content, we should, in my opinion, consult with the speaker on the business committee and the whips uh, with regard to the inclusion of unforeseen circumstances as part of this review 
in order to ascertain um, if there would be broader support for this proposal. So can we action that as well? Yes, certainly. Okay. So uh, in terms of item number seven, which is correspondence, you'll notice at 50, page 50 of your pack is a memo from uh, the clerk of the Public Accounts Committee in respect to audit office reports in which the PAC holds primacy over. Included is a list of audit office reports which PAC has released, agreed to retain primacy or reports which are currently under consideration. So 7.2 of page 62 is the latest publication of the Human Rights Newsletter. At 7.3 at page 74 is an email from the World Peace Foundation, India. At 7.4 at page 78 is a memo from the Chairperson's Liaison Group in respect of correspondence received from the Committee of for Justice regarding the Executive's decision to allow a condensed committee stage of damages return on investment bill. So are members content to note these items of correspondence? Agreed. Okay, thank you for that. And at 7.5, page 84, is a memo from the Business Committee which asks that the committee might consider petitions as part of its strategic planning. So given that the, we will discuss our strategic planning at the end of this meeting, are members happy uh, to discuss this issue during that session? Okay. That's us. So I want to advise um, the committee that will receive an update um, regarding our strategic planning at the end of this meeting and will consider a letter from the speaker in respect of potential items of work, uh, which will obviously or will, will, will shoot and form the committee's work programme. So are we content to move on to the next agenda item? Um, so there's no chairperson's business. Does any other member have any other items of business under AOB? No? Okay. So um, agenda item 11 is the date and the time of the next meeting is Wednesday the 21st of April at 2.30 via Starleaf. Emma, could you advise broadcasting that the meeting will now move into closed session? Please. I'll do that now. Broadcasting has said... Um... Committee room 29.